And during my time, we worked with over 800 companies, organisations, businesses, public sector bodies, helping them start the journey of understanding trans um, mm -hmm. and understanding uh, the way in which they could make provision for their trans and non-binary staff. <laughs> What inspired you to launch Deeds and Words? Well, it was it was something that uh, my partner Caroline was already working on. So, so me and Caroline met in 2008 when I was working at Stonewall, and we worked really closely together on the personal and professional development elements of Stonewall. So, the leadership programs, the role model programs, allies, the work we did with teachers, uh, you know, all those kind of different programs. Then we fell in love. Uh, so, Caroline. Uh, left Stonewall and set up a business called Deeds and Words and I joined her once I'd finished at Stonewall so we really wanted to bring our magic back together like we're a really good combo uh, in, in life and work and wanted to really use um, uh, our business to really achieve positive working cultures in organizations that have a strong sense of shared purpose so that doesn't necessarily we do lots with government we do lots with you know we work with a building society for example or the co-op so organizations that have a strong sense of what they're about mm -hmm. um, and really helping staff in those organizations find their find their connection so so we love it and deeds and words is a great um, way of doing those things why do you believe deeds and words must work together to improve equity and inclusion? Well, it's a great question. And actually, the reason why we called ourselves deeds and words is we were inspired by the suffragette movement. And of course, the, the slogan at the time for the suffragette movement was deeds, not words. And it's because they'd reached a stage of such sheer frustration with words that, that they felt that the only answer to achieve the vote was deeds mm -hmm. and I think that what we see is that that's incredibly important that you need deeds but you do also need words and it's the combination of the two and what we specialize in deeds and words and and during any talks I give or keynotes and things like that is about creating the space for people to talk to each other and reflect on what it is they might do because I think what we've learned over over decades is that telling grown-ups what to do doesn't work you have to create the space where they can talk to each other reflect think find its personal relevance and then find the deeds and I'm, that, that does take some words take some space so inspired by the suffragettes and a bit so deeds and words is, is our kind of motto motto and go to go to way of thinking about these things during your role as the ceo of stonewall what is your proudest achievement well, I worked at Stonewall for 14 years and was CEO for five, the last five years of that. And during that time, I, I, so I started at Stonewall when I was 24. I became CEO when I was 34. So that was quite a decade of significant change for lesbian, gay and bi people. Uh, lots of legal changes that, and social changes. My role as a junior, more junior member of staff was to change hearts and minds. Changing the law was one thing. How do you change hearts and minds? But what I was acutely aware of when I took over as CEO in 2004 was that there were lots of parts of our communities that were left behind, most notably for Stonewall Trans. So Stonewall didn't cover trans um, in, in the early days, and that changed in when I when I came in. But also how we talked about people of colour, how we talked about people from lower income backgrounds, how we supported people in other countries, how we could use Britain's power and soft diplomacy to to help those activists in those countries move things. So I think my proudest achievement was broadening out Stonewall and our looking beyond our peripheral vision to really help organizations think differently. And during my time, we worked with over 800 companies, organizations, businesses, public sector bodies, helping them start the journey of understanding trans um, mm -hmm. and understanding uh, the way in which they could make provision for their trans and non-binary staff was just inspiring and wonderful. And, and I, I do think that employers have such a key role to play in both creating that inclusive environment for uh, marginalised communities, but also sending a signal to wider society and communities about acceptance without exception. You published the book of Queer Prophets in 2022. What did you hope to achieve from this book? Well, when I left Stonewall, I got I got quite a few requests to write a book and, and people were saying, oh, will you write the history of gay rights? And, will you? and I was like, I don't I don't really 
want to do that. I, I've been too submerged in it. I can't I can't sufficiently take a step back to reflect on it. But I was acutely aware through my work, um, both at Stonewall, but also in 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 my in my time, I guess, that faith communities have a huge power, particularly Christian faith communities that have a huge power to change attitudes and to create a more accepting environment. And the Church of England in particular has huge power, both in the UK and internationally. But sometimes the narrative about LGBT people in churches is, is very linear, very basic, that it, it's assumed that these two things are incompatible. And I wanted to tell a different story. So I uh, talked to lots of people I know who have very different views on faith, different relationships with God, different ways into organised religion or spirituality. And I, I, I asked them to tell their stories. So what we have in the Book of Queer Prophets is, is a collection of essays of people reflecting on this question of faith, sexuality and gender identity and, and some ways through. And our hope was that it would help uh, faith leaders just take a slightly different view on some of these themes and, and, and find and create more welcoming environments for those who want to engage, both here and crucially globally. What does your role in the House of Lords entail? Well, I'm a, I'm Baroness Hunt of Bethnal Green, and um, and I was uh, very humbled, uh, genuinely humbled. I know the word humbled is used a lot on LinkedIn, but I was genuinely humbled um, to be asked by the then uh, Prime Minister Theresa May to join the House of Lords as a as a crossbench peer. And as a crossbench peer, it means I don't have any political allegiance. And the thing about the Lords, our, our role is quite specific. It is to scrutinise legislation that is coming through, but crucially to take the long view, to look at what what legislation is, is what impact it's going to have in the long term. You know, we don't think in these five year cycles, but I'm very young um, for the Lords. I'm very new. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely um, one of the, the, the handful of lesbians in, in the House of Lords. And so so sometimes I get a bit scared about how to navigate that space. You know, I think I think imposter syndrome is real. Uh, and I guess that my contribution is is twofold. First, I do a lot of work with uh, the steering group for, for culture change, looking at how staff and members of the House of Lords can work more effectively together. So really looking at how power and deference and hierarchy can disrupt the working of the House of Lords and stop us doing our best work. And on the other track, I'm doing my best to support all members of the House of Lords to understand more about particularly trans issues, LGBT issues, and look at the at, at how legislation might improve the lives of LGBT people um, and certainly not detract from their lives and experiences. But it's a life peerage, Megan, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm there for life. So I feel like I've got plenty of time to really learn how to influence in the most effective way. So it feels a very young, I feel very new on that on that pathway. How can businesses create an inclusive environment for their LGBTQ plus employees? Well, it's, it's the burning question. And in my, you know, I've been working on inclusion in employment uh, since 2001, really. Do you know what I mean? It's been my it's been my career for for all my life. Even as president of the Students Union in Oxford, we were asking those questions in 2001. And as the first openly lesbian president of the student union that, that you know I had a responsibility then and I think in all that time that the thing I've learned is that the very best organizations who really grasp this and, and have an impact are those that align it with organizational purpose so those who keep it as something separate on the left hand side of the desk a soft thing um, a nice um, PR thing or a CSR thing it tend to not make much traction those who say, right, we are in the business of selling phones. We're in the business of selling food. We're in the business of keeping the country safe in the armed forces. Why do we need inclusion to achieve that? And of course, those who sell the phones go, well, we know that our customers come from a range of different backgrounds. We can't all look the same if we're going to sell. Those who are producing food say we cannot, we have to be able to give customers what they need in terms of food. We don't know what Tower Hamlets needs because we're all white people. We need to employ some people who actually know what people in Tower Hamlets need. And for the armed forces, it's very clear that a mix of minds, different perspectives genuinely improve the execution of an operation. Mm -hmm. So those who, who truly grapple with that question, link it to their 
absolutely business orientated risk register, their business operations, their business objectives yield greater results. They might do less. There might be fewer events, fewer banners, fewer rainbows, but the impact of what they do is far more significant. Mm. The second variable is those who support their staff to, to be part of that change, where cultural evolution is not just left, left in the hands of the e equality and diversity lead or the HR director, but everybody at every grade does something. So the receptionist has pronouns on their badge. Um, the person who welcomes you into the door knows how to how to welcome you if you're in a wheelchair, mm -hmm. as well as the CEO recognising the inequalities that women might be experiencing within their ranks. So it takes everybody taking a different view on this stuff to really make an impact.